Today I'm privileged to preach 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 through 6, in a sermon that I've titled Assurance and Evidence. Pray it's a blessing to your soul. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 through 6, John says this, And by this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in Him, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. A wonderful passage of clarity, and every word of God's word matters. We want to be mindful, we want to be careful in reading it, understanding it. We want Scripture to interpret Scripture, that we're not bringing external things, again, traditions, human preferences for how we think things should work or what we've been told we want the lord to refine and reform and and teach us and and show us what is truth as we look to these opening words of verse two john says and by this so as we read that we we have to understand he's building on what he just said in verse one and two and is going to bring some application so let's go back to verse one and two the focus of last week's sermon and see what causes us to know or to have assurance that we know God. That's his point. 1 John chapter 2, 1 and 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's an important passage that we have to, again, rightly understand, not apart from the rest of the Scripture, but in light of the rest of the Scripture. If you missed that sermon, I would encourage you to go back, have a good, clear, biblical understanding of, of these verses. Some of these could be largely taken out of context, if not understood rightly according to the Word. But this essentially, our focus last week, is the gospel. The grace of God, the holy God, to save many undeserving sinners. That's what grace is. Grace is an unobligated giver, a giver who's not obligated to give, giving a gift that the person receiving it is not deserving of. If the receiver is deserving, or if the giver is obligated, then it's not grace, it's something else. So, We were not deserving. We were deserving of His wrath in our sin. Nor was He obligated. What what actually we were obligated, what we were deserving of because of our sin was His wrath. But by His grace, He chooses to save many. That His only Son would take on flesh, live without sin, die, rise again to conquer death as the forerunner of many of God's people. He chose to give us to give us an advocate to complete a work that we in our sin could not would not do to fully pay the price that we owed God is the one who saved us and so our hope and our assurance of our salvation is in him not in our own performance or will or work we are his we are indeed his saved and that salvation is as solid as it possibly can be because it is in him it's grounded in god think about uh, no no metaphor i would give you no no point of comparison to say it's as solid as rock that would be a lacking description of how solid god is It's secured, Scripture says, in the righteousness of Christ. How righteous is Christ? Perfectly righteous. It's protected by the strength of God. How strong is God? No one competes with the strength of God 
the Almighty One. Peter says it so well in a great passage, 1 Peter 1, 3-5. I'll throw it on the screen for you quickly. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It's kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Our hope, church, Christian, is living. It's a living hope. It's not a dead hope. It's not uh, wavering. It's living. Why? Because it's fixed in Christ. It's, it's on His resurrection. It's not in jeopardy. We have assurance. Not because of our performance or ability to keep it together, but because of God's. Verse 1 and 2, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. That big theological word, the one who, who gets our sins to be removed from us. It, it, it's, it, there's a turning, there's an appeasement of God's wrath due our sin. Have an advocate, Jesus, he's the propitiation of our sins. By this, his work to save us, we know that we have come to know Him. Because of the Gospel, because of God's saving work in our lives, due to Jesus' propitiation of our sins, by the righteousness of the Savior, we know, we have assurance, we have confidence. So John is saying this to safeguard his Christian friends and family against any kind of spiritual amnesia or fleshly doubt. There are, there are people spinning up and saying things, people rising up to prominent places to, to, to speak mistruths. Much of this letter is John pastorally writing to the church to correct those things. These people are spewing lies. They're not the gospel. They're not the word of God. As tempting as they are to believe in them and to like them and to get caught up in the fanfare, this is the truth. And, and we need this too, not just the hearers of this first letter as they received it in that day. We need it. We need the Word of God, the truths of God, echoing regularly in our minds to combat the ways the flesh wants to think fleshly, to justify, to combat the temptations or the, or the, um, the deception of the enemy. We need to remember who we were when we were enslaved in our sin and remember who we've become in Christ as a result of His substitutional atonement on our behalf. Church, we, we had no hope for anything lasting, anything eternally good apart from Christ. We had no hope for God. That was our sad and sobering position before salvation. And it remains the sad and sobering condition for all who remain outside of Christ. But there's good news. Jesus came. He died. He rose again. In the, in the resurrected Savior, we have a living hope. This is Peter's words in 1 Peter 1.3. In the author of Hebrews chapter 6.11 says basically that in Christ, the saints have the full assurance of hope until the end. Full assurance. Christian, how, how, how do you have your certainty, your assurance? Based on what? Based on God. Paul says in Romans 5.5, 5, Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who He has given to us. Paul says in Ephesians 2.13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Praise God for the saving grace and the perfect work of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Real and lasting hope, real assurance 
is founded, is grounded in Jesus. And so I'll use the words of a famous old hymn. I think I mentioned them last week. I bring them again to you today. Christian, is your hope built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness? It's not him and something else. It's built on nothing less than his blood and righteousness. That's the hope. My assurance, my grounding, my confidence is in him. You dare not trust the sweetest frame, the sweetest thing presented to you. You wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ is the solid rock we stand. And all other ground is sinking sand. Amen? The good news is truly good news to us when we have a clear view of the bad news of our helplessness, our hopelessness, our absolute damned condition apart from Christ. John is saying to the Christian who he's writing, know who you are in Christ. Be assured. And what he says next then is in regards to the evidence of that saving faith in Jesus. That it's true and it's not fake or superficial. Look with me at the rest of verse 3. 1 John 2, 3. And by this, that gospel that he just mentioned in 1 and 2, we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. Now, really clearly off the bat, the Bible is not saying there that you have to keep His commandments in order to have confidence, in order to be saved. No, we rest on Jesus alone. But the evidence of salvation, the evidence of knowing God, of being saved, of being His, is obedience to His commands. He says, if, if the evidence of obedience to God is present. Think about it. If you obey God's commands, then you are not giving in to your sin or your selfishness. You're not deceived. You're not self-governed. You're doing what He says is good and right. You're believing God's ways are best, and you're doing them. The evidence that we truly belong to God, that we truly know Him, that we are truly saved, that we truly love Him, is that we keep His commandments. Jesus himself says it this way, John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is super simple, and yet often an ignored foundation of the Christian faith. The byproduct of true love for God is devotion to him and obedience to his commands. Again, this is not a difficult thing to grasp, and yet many in John's day were being confounded by false teachers. And still many today can get caught up in this idea of proclaiming that I can know God, I can be saved, and yet live in unrepentant sin, disobeying God's commands on me. It's not difficult to grasp. Let me, let, me, let me help you see. It's really this way with many other things in life, or it's hypocrisy. If, you, if I tell you I really love the game of golf, but you never see me engaged in it or having anything to do with it, you would really question if I really love the game. Those of you who know me, if I said out loud to everyone here, I really love the game of tennis, you would laugh. Because I don't love the game of tennis. I, you never have seen me ever be excited about tennis, engage it, play it. I don't even understand it. If you say you love your job, but you constantly show up late and you put in the minimum effort at work, do you really love your job? If you say you love your spouse, but you live in a constant state of selfishness and disregard for God's good design for what marriage is to be, do you really love your spouse? If you say you're committed to getting healthy, but you continue to eat junk food and extra large portions, are you really committed to getting healthy? It is simply not true love if not backed up with the way you live your life. 
It is hypocrisy to say that you've died to yourself and now joyfully belong to Jesus as Savior and Lord, and then to reject obeying his commands. John's word is simple. You're a liar. You cannot love Jesus and disregard the fact that he is God. Which means if you know that he is God, you love him and you submit to him. You, you, your love for God means you love to be ruled by him. To love Jesus is to love his rule, his authority in your life, which means you keep his commandments. Percy Hayward is an old Bible scholar from the late 1800s, early 1900s. He was a Christian contemporary, A.W. Pink, J.C. Ryle. And he spoke to this very well in a small quote when he says, All sentimental talking and singing about love are vain unless by grace we show a truthful obedience. There is more hypocrisy than we suppose. Love is practical or it's not love at all. Notice he says, unless by grace we show a truthful obedience. You have to understand, you will not obey God's commands unless by His grace you are given the ability to do so. By grace you're given new life in Christ. You're reborn. The old self was depraved, dead in our sin, not sick in our sin as some like to say, it's an unbiblical view, dead, incapable, not wanting, nothing we did, wanted God was for God. We had to be made alive, spiritually alive, reborn. The Spirit comes on board. And now I have a Spirit-empowered desire to honor God, to obey His commands, to make much of Him, and to serve Him as Lord, no longer myself. We are reconciled by, to God by God, and therefore we obey Him. Why? Because I'm a new creation. Because my old self and longings have died, and the new self and longings are born. Now, while there's still a need for great maturity, an infant when born is grossly immature. So we're not talking about perfection. We're talking about a true, God-given, new birth, spiritual awakening to know Him, honor Him, fight sin, turn to what is righteous. And we mature in that. We do not obey God so that we can be accepted by God. That's not the gospel. That's a man-made religion, and it's a hurdle you will never fulfill. We obey because we are redeemed and given new life in Christ, a new heart for God. The evidence of our new birth in Christ and true love for God is our obedience. It's game-changing. We start to call the things that God calls good, good, and the things that God calls bad, bad. The late great Baptist pastor, preacher, Charles Spurgeon, had a great illustration he would use to help people understand this. I want to share it with you this morning. He says this, If you put out an amazing steak dinner from the top chef in the region, and you also put out a bucket of slop, and then you release a hungry pig to go eat. Every single time that pig is going to pass on the refined steak and eat the slop. Why? Because it's a pig. It has a nature of a pig, and that's what the pig wants and likes to eat. If that pig is supernaturally transformed into a human man, then the very thing he once loved, he now hates and doesn't want to eat the slop anymore. Instead, he pulls his head out of the bucket, throws up everything he can to be done with it, counts it as atrocious, as disgusting. He's embarrassed that he could ever stoop so low and abundantly thankful to be given a new nature to long for what he now knows is the better thing. 
The person who is truly converted is supernaturally changed by God in His grace and by His power. And the result is your will, your desires shift from sin-loving and self-seeking, self-righteous pig to a sin-hating, God-honoring, loving man. Now, let me be clear. This doesn't mean that we're perfect. No. We often forget we're no longer a pig, and we put our head back in the bucket of slop. But if the nature has been transformed in regeneration by God, what will happen is you will realize what you're doing, and you'll stop, and you'll vomit it out, and you'll turn from it. This, that's something the pig would never do. If we are in a season where we have our head and shoulders buried in the bucket, it might be a brother or sister in Christ, or a sermon, or a scripture you read, or simply the conviction of the Holy Spirit to wake you up to what you're doing, but you will repent. You will turn from the slop and back to the stake. From the sin back to Christ. Why? Because you're not a pig anymore. Humans don't love pig slop once they know the goodness of the top chef's dinner. Church, when God has regenerated our hearts, our longings change and grow increasingly over time for what is righteous and good. Our desire is to please the Lord more and more. And our sin and our flesh less and less. Awakened in Christ, alive in the Spirit, we don't make it about us. We don't make it about what we want and don't have. We don't make it about what we have and don't want. We make it about Christ. It's no longer about me. I live for Him. I've been awakened from the slavery of my sin that made it only about me. I want Him. I am satisfied in Him. I want Him to rule over me. His commands are not a burden to me. John really wants his hearers to get this. And so he's in a circle back. I'm going to peek ahead with me just for a brief moment. 1 John chapter 5, 2 through 3, John says this, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. We need this. We need this word, church. We need this sermon, and I'm thankful that we're going to be back to it again. Christian, you cannot love God and despise or, dis- despise or disregard His commands. His commands are not burdensome to the true believer. They're counted as good. Do you know when the commands of the Lord become burdensome in our lives? We've all sinfully allowed that to happen at times or places. It's when we're truly more interested in serving our will instead of God's will. When in sin we set Him aside, we don't see rightly what the gospel has provided for us. We get our affections or our priorities all focused on ourselves or on the creation and off the Creator that will have an attitude of despising His commands or considering them a burden. But when we're regenerate, rightly focused on and treasuring Jesus as the greatest things as our, in our lives, as sufficient, as praiseworthy, we long to keep the commands of our Lord and not to despise them. We count them good. It is only sin that causes us to reject faithful submission to Jesus' commandments, to find a way out of line, to, to find a way onto an island, to do our own thing. A true Christian may backslide for a moment, even for a, a season. But in the end, the true Christian, because they've been transformed, because the Spirit's at work, they will confess their sin and turn from it and submit to Jesus as Lord. Why? Because their heart's been changed. 
the good tree cannot produce a lasting crop of bad fruit. If it does, it proves to not be a good tree at all. The evidence of the true believer who loves Jesus as Lord of their life is the one who has and keeps the commandments of God. And sadly, it's common today for Christians who truly desire to be obedient to the word to be accused of being legalistic or fundamentalist. Right? I've had that, maybe that said, I mean, you're being really legalistic. Your longing is just to obey God's word. Your conviction is to honor and obey God's word and will. And sometimes that's going to cause other people to define you as a bigot, as an intolerant person, as self-righteous, or a homophobe, or I mean, I could go on and on. Their motive is generally to slander you so that others won't listen to you. But what's really happening here, watch this, is the true Christian simply wants to do and honor God's revealed will. He or she just wants to eat the steak dinner, not because they're trying to keep the rules or put on a show, but because it's so much better. Because he or she loves God. Because he or she is not a pig anymore. And so they don't want to eat from the slop bucket. The commands and ways of God are are not foreign or burdensome. They're not mean or bad. They're good. They're righteous. They're wonderful. They're loving and worthy to be faithfully followed, even when it's hard, Christian, even when it's costly. And so many prosperity teachers out there will try to sell that there's a way to love and follow and commit to Jesus without it being costly. And I just, I don't, I don't understand which Bible they're reading. Because all of the greats of faith had great cost to their lives, their families, their reputations for following Jesus. Jesus was so clear to say, they're going to hate you because they hate me. Church, we must make war with modern-day antinomianism. Big theological word that means anti-law. People who want to say it's all grace. The law doesn't matter. It's a rejection of God's good commandments on His creation. And it's anti-gospel. It's complete opposition to the teaching of Christ and His Holy Word. We cannot play light with our lifestyle, our words, our actions, because they tell the story about who we truly are and who God truly is. When God says, don't have any other gods before me, we don't justify our overcling to the good things that he's created. and clinged, we, Instead, we cling to God above everything else. That includes our family, our children, our job, our, our, our money, our reputation. When God says do not murder, we don't condone, justify, or advocate for the abortion of babies in the womb whom God has ordained unto life by His sovereign decree no matter the circumstances of their conception. It is the Lord who gives life and takes it away. Not us through self-serving, self-justified, circumstantial murder of life of a human being in the womb. When God says marriage is for a man and a woman, and that it is sinful to engage in sexual activity with anyone who is not your spouse, we don't participate in a redefinition of marriage or engage in extramarital intimacy, or justify the practice of homosexuality because it actually seems to be helping this person whom we love have a better life. We trust God. We follow His commandments. We stand on what He says is good and true. When God says, do not lie, we confess our sin and receive the consequences for it. We don't 
lie or deceive and put a mask over it because it's going to negatively affect our life. Wear a mask of deception. Church, the true people of God love God and obey His good and perfect commandments. We don't rewrite them. We don't make our own adjustments to them. We joyfully submit to Him. He is our life. He is our God. He is our authority. Look with me now at verse 4. 1 John 2, 4. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That's pretty clear. And yet you'll have a lot of people say, oh no, but you shouldn't have judgment over other people. Only God knows their heart. Well, that's true. Only God knows their heart. But if someone's saying, I know him, I belong to him, but not, doesn't keep the commandments, God's word says that they're a liar. And the truth is not in them. I'm not saying anything that God's word's not saying. There's something really clear here. To put off the commands of God and to say they're not necessarily necessary are simply not reading and trusting in Scripture, in God's clear words, that those who belong to Jesus will submit to God's commands in their life. People who say, I believe in Jesus Christ, or I'm good with God, but then reject God's clear commands and do life their own way, they prove to be a liar. They, they show evidence that the good truth of God is not in them. God's good commandments are not done away with in the name of grace. No, it's God's grace that gives us the desire and ability to obey them. That's what Scripture teaches. Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, unless until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota or not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In the name of love, are we guilty of relaxing the clear commandments of God, thinking I'm helping someone out? Our obedience and our submission to God's will and commands on us is the evidence of our true faith. Those who say they belong to Christ but do not submit to God's will and commands, prove they do not have genuine faith. Instead, they have a fake faith, a superficial faith. John 8.31, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in Him, If you abide in My word, you are truly My disciples. Just prior to this verse in John 8.30, John, who's narrating this, writing this gospel, says, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. So in other words, what's happening here is there's a group of people who are on the outside looking to profess faith in Jesus. They're now starting to follow Jesus. But John testifies a very sobering reality. Many people who were moved, motivated to start following Jesus to say they believe in him. They followed him for a time, liked maybe what that produced for their life. But because they were never truly converted, truly belonging to Jesus, they proved to be false disciples who proved to only have superficial faith, an outward impression or even self-deceived belief that I'm in There's no real conversion. They proved to be Lord of their own lives because they reached a junction where they said, nah, I don't like where the Lord's going. I'm going to go my own way now. In this, they proved that their belief was fake or superficial. John's Gospel has example after example of this happening. We need not be surprised when it happens among us today. One of the markers of the genuineness of your faith is the aim of your faith. If the aim of your faith in Jesus is what you get out of it, then God is just a means to a, another end. He's not the prize. That's idolatry. 
If you get to a place where what his good word says is true or right, and you don't like it, so therefore you pull back, you drift, you walk away, you find another church to itch your ears and tell you what you want to hear. Or maybe you just slow down, unplug altogether from Christ's family and God's truths and just stop altogether. This happens because your heart's desire is not truly for Christ. It's, you still live for you. Like many in John's day, following Jesus was good for a while until it got in the way of what they really wanted. No, the aim of our faith needs to be Jesus. And if it is, then He's everything. My life, my schedule, my priorities, my dreams, my money, my family is all for Him. It was bought with a high price, and by faith, I'm all in to follow and obey Him no matter what it cost. Jesus Himself said, because of your faith for Him, there will be division in your own families. Why? Because there is a real divide between those who are spiritually alive and belonging to Jesus and those who are spiritually dead. And even though they might have participated in religion for a time, they don't love Jesus or his word. They don't. And so there's real contention there, division. So I love that Jesus was so thorough to say that because it helps us understand when that's happening that it's like we don't start thinking, what am I doing wrong? And he said this was going to happen. Jesus, he listened to his words. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Because there are many who have this superficial faith. They, he knows the content of their hearts, right? So he's saying, here's the litmus test. Are you really serving me as Lord? Are you doing what I've said you are to do? I love his word, the emphasis of the word truly. I don't know about you, I want to truly be his. I don't want to just think I'm his. I don't want to pretend I'm his. I don't want to kind of be his. I want to truly be his. What Jesus is saying here is the litmus test that's so valuable for us. And it's what John's saying in our passage too. And so let's, let's capture a couple of things they both say. Jesus and what John's saying here. And, and the first is an emphasis on abiding. To abide is to stay fixed, to continue, to endure, to remain. True believers abide. We remain faithful to Christ. We've been grafted back into that which is life. And we abide in Him. Our entire lives could be falling apart. Nothing could be going the way we want it to. But I cling to Him and His promises. And I don't stray from doing what He calls me to do. I'm His. I abide. Again, John's going to hit on this point later in, in 1 John chapter 2, just a few verses away, verse 19. He's going to say, They went out from us. They were not really of us, for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they're not really of us. They lacked real abiding. They didn't remain. What is the key evidence for those who prove they were not one of us, not a true disciple of Jesus? They didn't remain. God's word is clear to say all of his chosen ones, all whom he saves, he will have. God doesn't have a weak batting average. It's perfect. Everyone he's chosen, he will have. And he endures them. He protects them to the end. So there is no having faith, losing faith. That's not the teaching of the scripture. You either had superficial faith, never believed at all, looked like you were playing the game, and the evidence of it is you didn't remain, you didn't finish. The writer of Hebrews emphasizes this many times. Most clearly at the end of chapter 10, verse 30, 
8.39, right in there, he quotes Habakkuk. Um, Hebrews, Hebrews 10.38, My righteous one shall live by faith. If he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Proves to not have been one of us. The author of Hebrews says in verse 39, But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. The, the one who turned back, who walked away, who shrunk away from their steadfast testimony of Christ, God has no pleasure in them. But those of true faith, they persevere and they're not destroyed. Those are big words. Again, they persevere. They don't walk in perfection. Only Christ did that. This is why the markers of the true believers is that you will repent. Repentance is a good thing for a Christian. Why? Because we're going to sin. And when we do, we confess it and we turn from it. Sometimes that takes not one conversation. It takes two. Matthew 18. Go to your brother. Confront them. If they, don't, if they repent, great. You've won your brother back. Praise God. If they don't, you bring another. Sometimes it takes the bringing the other. And if they don't, then you bring it before the church. And if they're going to say, you're all wrong, and I'm the only one who's right, then you treat them as an unbeliever. Why? Because they're not obeying God's commands. They're, they're, they're proving to be the Lord of their own life. You're to treat them as an unbeliever. Pray that maybe even that third step was finally what was needed, that they would return with real repentance. And if that's the case, then we receive them back. But if we don't, we don't keep walking with them in their false testimony because it lies about who they are in Christ. It lies about the gospel, which is what's most important. True disciples endure to the end. When they struggle or slip or wonder, they repent, they turn back. They don't abandon ship. Skip the first part of verse 5. I want to come back and conclude with that. Look with me at the second part of verse 5 and verse 6. 1 John 2, 5-6. through six. Let's see now John's words that are very in line with what Jesus just said. By this we may know that we are in Him. Here's more evidence. Whoever says he abides in Him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So there's a declaration that I have God, I trust Jesus, I say unto you, I abide in Him. But then there's also the evidence of that. Is there a walk that matches the declaration? John is saying that those who truly abide in Jesus have the evidence of their abiding in Christ, which is Christian maturity, the fruit of the Spirit. We who abide in Jesus, we don't do it our own way. We don't put in our pocket our salvation and we kind of pick the things out of Scripture we like and then we do everything else. You know, we kind of disregard the rest. No, no, I belong to Him. I understand that being a Christian is I died to myself, now I belong to Jesus. And there's nothing better. He's my Lord. I'm His slave. That's the best thing that's ever happened in my life. You can have the rest. We don't lean on our own reasoning. We want to be corrected. I, I love the journey of reformation and refinement. It's my journey. It's many of our journeys. Maybe it's your journey where you've had a lot of years of thinking about God in certain ways, being even taught about God in certain ways. And I just want to ask you, if you truly believe, if you truly love Him, you want anything that's not biblical to be corrected. You want God's truths to correct you. Why? Because you truly love God. You don't love your church, your religion, your friends at church so much so that you stay faithful to that. You ignore it. No. If I'm missing the truth, correct me with the truth. Let's go. Hold me accountable to the truth. I, there was many seasons in my own life I was good at a certain kind of church that as I started to study the Word more, I had to put some of this stuff away. A kind of preaching, a kind of gathering crowds. I had to get outside of my own head to go, we're going to have a smaller crowd if I preach God's word, God's way. And we do. 
And yet, it's producing the best kind of fruit, the, the best kind of maturity and devotion and discipleship and sanctification. And, and it actually kind of mirrors a lot more of the kind of crowd that followed Jesus. Wasn't that big? Many people who kind of seemed to be all into it for a moment went back to their old ways. Why? Because they proved to have superficial faith. We want to do it His way. We, we know that He's going to have all of His. So we, we, we don't worry about the results. We worry about what He's called us to do, making disciples and raising a generation of the Lord to see people come to faith in His time, not ours. We trust Jesus. We, we, we obey Jesus. We abide in Christ. And as a result, the, the Spirit bears fruit in our lives. We walk more and more like Christ. I love his metaphor in John 15. Jesus says in verse 5 through 8, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch that withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. See this common thread? There's this abiding. There's this obedience. And that's the proof that we are truly His disciples. Again, that word abide means to continue to remain, to dwell, to stay plugged into the source that is Christ. You don't thrive in the Christian life by turning away or unplugging. It's in those seasons that you drift, that you're susceptible to temptations, the the, the longings of the flesh. To abide is to remain constantly pondering God's Word, acting and living for His glory and His will, living out who He is in you. Christian, you are to be always desperate for Him, never thinking that you can have Him for a moment and then move forward without Him. The illustration I've used in the past that helps this is, Jesus is not a defibrillator. where You get hit with the paddles and, and, and... he jump starts your heart, your life, and then you're done with that experience and you kind of move on. You do your best to, do, to live a good life. That's not the gospel. That's not Jesus' work in your life. He's more like a pacemaker that you're desperate for to abide in him every moment or you die. He's a forever part of you, source of true life. You're dependent on him in every way. This is why the branch and the vine metaphor is so perfect. Because a branch that's separated from the vine is dead. It doesn't grow fruit apart from the vine. We don't come to church, get a little plug in, a little charge up, and then go out on our own. No, we abide in the vine. We're grafted in and and we grow in Christ. I always try to remind you, Christian growth is not to produce more fruit, love, patience, selflessness. As a Christian, you don't focus on those things. Why? Because you don't grow those things. Your focus needs to be on the vine. Abiding, treasuring, submitting, knowing, clinging to, trusting Jesus. And then what happens? He grows the fruit of the Spirit in you. That's why it's not called the fruit of filling your name. It's the fruit of the Spirit. That's evidenced in your life. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. We're called to bear much fruit, not just some fruit. Are you content too much lately with just some fruit? Like, yeah, 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 I got Jesus. We do the church thing. Man, someone's got to love you enough to go like, what? what's the gospel to you? Because the real gospel flips your whole life upside down. There's nothing better. You don't kind of do this thing. You're all in. 
You tolerate a few weekends away to go vacation, be away from the church body. You don't find a regular pace of that. You love the family of God. You love the preaching of the Word. You love the opportunity to serve the saints and to make disciples. That's who you are. The goal is not to be content with just some fruit, but much fruit. I want to be just as hungry 30 years from now for real sanctification in my life as I am now. Never done. God's will for the redeemed is that we would be very fruitful for God's glory. This is the only way we walk in the same way in which He walked. That's what John's saying here. The fruit of the Spirit is a growing Christ-likeness. It's evidenced in a righteous maturity, a God-honoring lifestyle. Producing the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I love how many people are in our congregation. If you knew them 10, 15, 30 years ago, and then now you saw them today, you're like, who are you? Because the Spirit is producing a new person. Now, our society is going to say there's a lot of ways you can find love, you can find patience and happiness and self-control. You know, plug into a good podcast and listen every day. Practice yoga. Read self-help books. Take the right medications. Make changes to your circumstances. Some of those are nonsense. Some of those are okay. Maybe helpful. But see with me that all of them are external modifications. And whatever manual effort and an external modification you're making of your steering wheel, you're going to get tired. And it's going to slip back to whatever your autopilot is. No, what you need is an internal transformation that only the Spirit does in you to give you new longings and new convictions and a new way of going at these things. There's two ways you can bend to metal. You can try to force it, and most likely what's going to happen is it's going to go right back. Or you can heat that metal from the inside and then bend it in whatever shape it needs to be, and it will stay. One's an external modification. One is an internal work, an application of another source. Christ alone is the source of your internal change. Therefore, you have to abide in Jesus, the vine, who is life. Apart from him, you can do nothing that honors God. And only when you're clinging to him, walking in him, trusting him, Does he change you from the inside out, producing a person that you never would have produced on your own? Sadly, many have been taught or bought into the idea that Christian life is just essentially a big effort of external modification. So many modern-day churches' sermons are essentially a big list of to-dos and not-dos and filled with stories and movie illustrations and like, let me just try to get you on a better path. Or church groups or studies are very surfacey, very, you know, let's get together, we'll kind of talk about it. Hey, how do you feel about this? What does this mean to you? Jesus didn't come to give us a casual experience of a better life now. He came to die for us so that we would die to ourselves to live in Christ every day for the glory of God. A famous Christian author once said, Christ says, give me all. I have not come to torment your natural self. I've come to kill it. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires, those which you think are innocent as well as those that you think are wicked. The whole outfit. I will give you a new self. In fact, I will give you myself. My own will shall become yours. First John 2, 5-6 And by this we 
may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Is there evidence of remaining in Christ? Even when it's hard, Christian. Even when your natural self wants to do something else, you abide in Christ. You walk in his power. You walk according to his words and for his purposes. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Remember with me, church, our time in Ephesians the last couple of years. Therefore, be imitators of God. Abiding in Christ means that you'll be an imitator of God. You will become more and more Christ-like. This is why the prescribed, God-prescribed practice of discipleship is the central focus of the New Covenant Church. When we got to rename our historic church, we were super stoked to have a simple name that's focused on the very central thing the church is called to do in this time, making disciples. And really stoked we could get the website, discipleschurch.com. That was great. (laughs) Pastor John MacArthur said it well. What happened when you were saved is you confess Jesus as what? As Lord. Jesus is Lord. That's the great Christian confession. Jesus is Lord. Curios, I am doulos, his slave. He's my master, my Lord. That essentially defines what it means to be obedient. He is the master, I am the slave. He is sovereign, he is the ruler. He gives the orders and the commands, and I respond in loving obedience. As Christians, we should growingly answer crossroad questions that way. Do I go left? Do I go right? What does God want for me? That's what I want. This is why we humble ourselves to invite others in. This is why men in our church growingly are doing something they never thought they would do as a grown man. I'm my own man. I'll take care of my household. But Christ in you starts to go, I'm blessed to humble myself and invite in other brothers to point me to God's word so that I wouldn't go left or right. I tell you often, this is a practice you don't do in just the immature stages of your faith. I think you do it in some of the most mature stages of your faith. Maybe better than ever. The elders at our church, we don't make big decisions alone. Not because we're not capable. We've proven to be very capable of making good, God-honoring decisions. But because we've learned the joyful benefit of not missing something. I want to be held accountable. I want to honor the Lord. I'm just as prone to tweak this just a little bit, even convince my wife this is a great decision. Love me enough to point me back. Because I want to honor God. That's, That's it. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, go into the world and make disciples. How are we to do that? Teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. Lasting obedience to God is a constant marker of being saved, of a true disciple. The test of a true disciple is faithfulness of the disciple to remain, continue, and endure in obedience to the Master. Growing Christ-likeness to walk like Him. And can I just say, this isn't new. Deuteronomy 8, 6, So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in His ways and by fearing Him. Psalm 1, this glorious psalm, verse 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Church, the people of God live lives in a way that honors God. We reveal the work of the Lord in our lives by walking, talking, and living out what God has done and is doing. So I just ask you this morning, how are you walking? How are you living? What are you doing with the days that God's graciously given you? Are you abiding in Christ in all things? Are you obeying His commands? This is the evidence of we who truly belong to Him. To close, look back at the first part of verse 5, 1 John 2, 5. Whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. 
Church, this is good news. God is not done refining us, maturing us, sanctifying us. We must remain in faith and keep the word, hold fast to it, meditate on it day and night. He's growing us. That we would obey it, we'd live it out. And as we do, truly the love of God is perfected in us. Amen? For His glory and for others' good, may this be so. Pray with me. Father, I thank You for this day that You have made opportunity to, to gather, to fellowship, to pray, to worship You. The opportunity to hear Your Word, to, to, to do business with what You proclaim is truth. To, to be reminded of the assurance we have, the confidence that we know, that we know you, that we're reconciled to you because of Christ, because of your work, not because of ours. And that the evidence of that true salvation, that real saving faith, not superficial faith, but real faith, real transformation, is a life that loves you and loves to obey you. And so do your work in us. Where there's a need for conviction and confession and repentance, do that work. Where there's a need for refinement and growth and maturity and humility, do that work. Today, for some maybe who enter this place, Lord of their own lives, maybe practiced in religion but still denying the gospel, that they would have ears to hear and eyes to see by your sovereign decree, that they would see their sin, confess it before you, and turn from it by trusting Jesus as Lord, to die to self and to live for Him the rest of their days. What a blessing it is that you save many deserve, undeserving sinners. That we would glorify you, make much of your holy name. Thank you for your steadfastness. For your faithfulness even when we lack. That you won't let us go. Oh, do your work in us, Lord. For your glory and fame. Hear us now as we respond in song, as we prepare to go to the mission field in this day that you've ordained. In Jesus' name we pray.